Namaskar. Hello and welcome to P Guru's channel. I'm your host Sri Ayer. Today is the 12th episode of Ask Me Anything. Ask Abhijit. Abhijit, welcome to P Guru's channel. Veil, veil, vetri veil, and thanks for having me on. Vetri veil, vira veil, jai mata di. Uh, Durge is uh, casting her karuna on which party do you think today? I don't think Durga has any karuna left for any party right now. <laughs> cluster, right. She doesn't forgive or forget cluster incompetence. <laughs> well, um, the challenges that are in front of India in terms of how to deal with US is something that we are going to start talking about as a, a prelude to this Ask Me Anything a session. So, Abhijit, a lot happened over the weekend and we were making a lot of noise in P Guru's channel also exhorting the lawmakers in the United States to get off of their rather wide behinds to get something, do something about this. After all, what we understood was that Serum Institute had actually paid for some raw materials and these were being blocked. In fact, Biden tweeted that they need it for themselves and they cannot send it. Be that as it may, see, if one thing that people now realize is this particular administration has a lot of flip-flops already. Within not even 100 days have passed, it's done flip-flop, flip-flop. So, so that raises the question, who really is running the government? Because a lot of people are saying that it is not Joe Biden who's running this administration. It is somebody else and somebody is using a proxy in the White House to do this thing. Conspiracy theory, maybe. What are your thoughts on this and how do you see this relationship moving forward? Look, America doesn't have a commander in chief at the moment. It has a cadaver in chief. This fellow is going to kick the bucket in about what? Uh, we'll be lucky if he sees through the year alive. Even Kamala, she is a front for corporate puppeteers. Let's be absolutely clear about it. Biden's victory was a victory of corporate, uh, corporate puppeteering. Right. The kind of uh, uh, antitrust monopolistic action they took against Trump, anything you want to see. Anyone with half a brain will figure out that this was a corporate prof a profiteering racket. Right. Now, who do you think would have stopped all of this? Obviously, people who have a vested interest in this. And if that wasn't bad enough, do you remember the statement that the White House press secretary made that, you know, uh, people should be grateful that Americans are getting vaccinated because every vaccinated American saves the world. This was their level of callousness. Now, if they have done a 180 degree black flip and mind you, it isn't that the blockage of equipment was flagged just on the last day. It has been flagged over an entire week. And they did nothing for it because if you remember, Jen Psaki was the first one to take that question. It has been flagged by several people in the United States. And finally, they acted after a week when they saw the level of anger that was rising in India. Understand and in US the too. government. And in US too. This. And in US too. Um, well, in the US, see, the problem is Democrat voting uh, NRIs are basically sold out trash, right? They voted for this government. So, you know, they're like dogs. They get very happy if you just pat them on the head. You don't even have to give them a bone. So they don't really count. What counted was the anger that they were seeing in India and their entire plans for uh, the quad or whatever. Mind you, even the quad has been made useless now because Biden has turned it into a climate change uh, forum for all effects and purposes. So it was more to do with the public outrage in India, not the kind of feeble begging that uh, uh, so-called NRIs did in uh, 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 America. Understood, understood. So, um, viewers, we will now jump straight into questions. But before I jump into questions, I'd like to make a fervent pitch for joining the membership of P Gurus. If you are in the United States and if you sign up for our gold membership, you, you will get a, cop, um, a, a replica of this beautifully laser carved Ganesha. And, and you can see the clarity on the lines. It's, it's absolutely beautiful. I can feel the grooves. And on your desk, it can be a great source of spiritual energy. After all, Ganesha is the remover of obstacles. And now, if you also 
if you join uh, our platinum membership guess what we'll sweeten the pot for you we're going to give you not just ganesha but also the ganesha chakra so ganesha and ganesha chakra go together and this is what we will ship to you if you join our platinum membership there you go i am done with my pitch i hope people will start uh, um, joining these two levels and let us jump right into questions abhijit here is the first question from kunal joshi should india leave the anglo sphere and work on an economic and security group with countries like france japan vietnam korea what other countries do you think should join and why love listening to you aim no i don't think we should leave it but see my advocacy of the american alliance has always been for one thing only which is indian interests you need the american market you need american technology okay uh, remember china became this rich and powerful because it had access access to the american market now if you haven't done that and if you haven't learned from china that america isn't a country it's a meat market where every senator and congressman is essentially a you know glorified prostitute up for sale to the highest bidder then you have really not done your job with america that's the problem right so right now what do you do you've realized you can't make this easier for america you have to make america look bad i think this particular episode showed america in a very 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 bad light and we have to take this further okay keep increasing your demands on america and show how completely useless they are how compromised the white house is to the chinese and that is what you need to do you need to shame america you need to show up america that is what you do so right now no but should be, because think of it this way even if you create an alternative alliance structure what is the point because your foreign policy idiots don't believe in alliances they don't want to be hitched up you know nobody is asking you to get into a permanent marriage you know this is what our clowns don't understand so what's the point here's a first question from manik ayer a joint development sam surface to air missile equivalent to s400 with enough technology transfer would have made a lot of sense but why aren't they forthcoming and instead threatening sanctions how to trust when they are given trust them when given what happened in the past few days this is the united states uh th- well look they did offer we settled for the s400 and there's a reason we settled for the s400 and that was mostly because this was the missile china had <clears throat> this was the missile that we bought the threat of which that we bought the rafale for it is your primary enemy right so what better than to get your primary enemy to test your weapons and your defenses against so that is why we went in for the s400 the problem is like with all things we don't explain our positions clearly we don't explain our thinking clearly and we substitute it with petulance which never works wonderful and we have our questions up and running my uh, editor has got his uh, system up and running now and here we go the first question or the second question i should say shailesh latkar wants to know the current situation is a rude awakening that the incumbent us administration is not reliable ally ally during its term who should india turn to I think we've already answered this question, haven't we? Yes, I think so. I'll go to the next question. Seeing how India is vulnerable due to COVID and the US support at minimal at best, is China likely to make a move on India's borders again now? Look, there's like I told you there's a huge military build up about 100 150 200 kilometers inside China. If and when they move, we will be able to tell you about 24 to 48 hours in advance right now no we're not seeing anything we're keeping an eye great next question is from venkatesh srinivasan and this is japan still hasn't amended article 9 wouldn't it affect its defense capabilities against china <coughs> and be unreliable in quad due to lack of experience in war 
even if its military technology is superior. This is, I think, the Japanese constitution that said that they will not have an army. Yeah, yeah. go ahead. Look, it it doesn't really matter because, you know, the Japanese, they follow that NATO philosophy of train like you fight and fight like you train. Okay, all of this just comes together in a very, very good way when they go and fight. I think we're still dealing with, uh, you know, this is the one thing I do know about cricket. Uh, and this is the only time. So this is why you should subscribe to P Gurus because the only time you'll ever hear me talking about cricket is do you remember when the South African team was first allowed to play when apartheid rules were lifted, as in when apartheid was dismantled, and I think their first trip was to India. That's correct. Or India was the first team to visit No, no, them. they came to India uh, first. You're right, yeah. Right. And everybody was thinking, oh, you know, the South Africans haven't played anybody. They haven't played international cricket for so long. <laughs> they whipped our and it turned behind. Out the <laughs> yeah, they ripped our behinds. <laughs> so, you know, never make the judgment based on if they haven't. If anything, it shows you that Japan is actually probably more focused without war fatigue. And they've, you know, they've accumulated all the right lessons from everybody. In fact, uh, I haven't spoken to Americans who have exercised with the Japanese, but I have spoken to the French who have observed Japanese war games and no Japanese military thinking. They are so obsessed with China. They go, they, their spies pick up every single tactic. Their uh, electronic spying picks up every single electronic signal. They've thought three, four steps through on how to counter the Chinese at every single step. Okay, number one. Number two, tell me who have the Chinese fought? As in who have the Chinese Nobody. realistically fought in the last 30, 40 years? Nobody. Right. So uh, it's kind of uh, apples and oranges comparison. Uh, Abhijit, didn't China lose to Vietnam too? They got thrashed very badly in 79, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, so let's next, uh, go to the next question. Uh, same Venkatesh Srinivasan. Kerala says it has enough oxygen to supply other states. Is it true or another farce like how credible they portrayed their health minister? I don't know if you know. They claimed that they were the most equipped to deal with COVID in the initial phases. And then the truth started emerging and Kerala was like the first from the last. Go ahead. Look, if Kerala can supply oxygen, then it should go ahead and do it. Do you see Odisha? Odisha is supplying all its neighbors with oxygen. Do you see Odisha making any of these claims? They're quietly doing what they need to do on the sides. So, you know, if somebody has got to do something, they do it. They don't go around boasting about it, number one. Number two, please understand there is no oxygen shortage in this country. Quite the opposite. We have a huge surplus oxygen manufacturing capacity. The problem is with oxygen A in Delhi and surrounding parts because of a transportation problem. We have the oxygen. We do not have the containers to transport it. We don't have the cylinders to then further redistribute it and things like that. Because remember, all the oxygen generation plants, they are all co-located with our iron and steel plants, right? So in Bellari, uh, the Tatas in Jamshedpur and things like that. There are a few in Odisha somewhere, uh, etc. And the thing is, because they're captive oxygen generation plants, they supply their local uh, 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 steel factory uh, through, uh, you know, through basic uh, trucks and uh, pipes and so on and so forth, not pipes, uh, trucks, uh, liquid oxygen containers, which is what those people require. Now they have enough to supply industry, they don't have enough to supply the entire country. So this country doesn't need liquid oxygen, we need liquid oxygen containers as in transporters, both train transporters and road transporters. And we need a heck of a lot more cylinders to transport that liquid oxygen or failing which you need oxygen concentrators on an individual basis, which is a much more uh, expensive uh, thing. So, uh, or you can buy these uh, portable oxygen generators. They're around the size of a half container. And depending, I mean, some of them are the size of a half container, some of them are the size of three containers. But, you know, uh, uh, hospitals can buy them and keep them. Remember, 
this had been authorized by the central government. They had given Delhi authorization for eight. Kejriwal did not buy them, and instead he's sending all the money to uh, 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 Republic TV and NDTV. And those people are so shameless, they won't even return that money knowing full well that it was earmarked for oxygen. <laughs> Um, the next question is, do you think Delhi is so focused up north that it ignores the radical Islamization in the south, especially Kerala? NIA recently opened a branch in Chennai. Well, you've kind of answered your own question. Now, if NIA opened a branch in Chennai, then they're clearly not ignoring it in the south. Well, when Abhijit reviews my book, which is centrally located around what we just we are talking about, I guess uh, NIA had to act. I mean, if if Abhijit brings it, if it if Abhijit shines the spotlight, come on now, they have to move. Anyway, <laughs> I'm just buttering you up. Here's an interesting question, Abhijit. I don't know the source of this, but I think I'll ask you still. Clarence Chan, Singapore dollars. So he is in maybe from Singapore. China is a better friend. China donated 800 oxygen machines to China. Uh, to China, I think uh, he means India. India is a proud Asian. Sorry, Asian. Can you repeat the question. Sorry, yeah, sorry, yeah. sorry. Can you just? No, I, I'm going to pass right now. Clarence, can you rephrase your question? There are some inherent uh, uh, conflicts in the question. So the next question, Arun Gupta wants to know. Hey, Abhijit, just saw a news piece by the Scroll, which stated that Arvind Kejriwal wasn't the one responsible for setting up the oxygen plants, but a central body. What do you think about this? Look, that's complete rubbish because this was what meant to be set up by both Maharashtra and by Delhi. And of course, Scroll will always write the kind of bullshit that it's used to writing. But remember, all health was decentralized. It had been centralized in wake of the lockdown. But it was all decentralized by October, by the third phase, was it October or September when the third phase yes, of unlock yes, happened? Yes. Well, whenever the third phase of unlock happened, all, all the powers were delegated to the states. Now, where does the center's culpability lie in two separate things? Number one is the price controls on uh, uh, the vaccines, which, you know, essentially slowed down production. And number two, not letting the states decide who essential workers are. So the standard everybody 45 over and we decide who essential health workers are was a criteria that should have been left to the states. Okay. Other than that, everything else was decentralized. So no, it wasn't a central panel. And the next question is very interesting. Given what's happened in Delhi, it's from Kunal Joshi. Given what's happened in Delhi and Mumbai with COVID, is there any provision for a medical emergency? If yes, should Modi do it and make fundamental changes? What's the point? What's the point? Because clearly, look, th th there are several issues here. Number one, the central government was warning of a breakout again, but that was based on laxity. They still allowed the Kumbela to go ahead. They did not crack down on the farmers' protest as they should have. Uh, they didn't put their foot down with the election commission and say, boss, no election rallies. Okay, so num th this is number one. Number two is that the virulence of this particular strain, nobody could have predicted it. Okay, I think there's a brilliant work in Nature magazine where everybody had underplayed or was, was unaware of this particular strain. Now, a proper epidemi epidemiologist you got it. would have known that it was the second wave of the flu in 1917 that hit India badly. But again, remember, you may remember that, but unless you see strains or signs of a strain mutation, of a virulent strain mutation, you can't just induce general panic and say shut everything down and emergency and things like that. What we've seen is, please understand, and I repeat this again and again and again, there is no vaccine shortage in India. There is no remdesivir shortage in India. There is no oxygen shortage in India. There is a huge supply side problem of vaccines, of remdesivir hoarding, 
of vaccine wastage and whatnot. There was that RTI report that came out which showed you exactly how much of the vaccine was being wasted. There was definitely a slowing of the vaccine as a sort of lackadaisical attitude to the vaccines. And with oxygen, it was entirely a transport issue. Okay. Otherwise, we have enough. Industrial uh, oxygen is enough to use in uh, uh, medical things. The only thing is the containers aren't kept as clean and sterilized as, say, a medical uh, oxygen container is. And that's very easy to clean because what you do is you take nitrogen gas and you purge the oxygen container. You do it three times and it's as good as medical condition as long as it's transported uh, in a proper condition. And you've also sterilized the valves and pipes that you use with it also with a, a nitrogen purge. Uh, Mr. Lee wants to know, is the USA allowing export of raw materials for Covishield or Novavax? The White House statement says Covishield, while Punawala requested raw materials for Novavax. I think the White House statement said the manufacturer of Covishield. So there is a, a bit of parsing that needs to be done. Is, is Mr. Punawala getting what he wanted? Look, I... Uh, I've tried searching, but I, there is no clarity on if Mr. Poonawala is getting what he wanted. What Mr. Poonawala wanted was for Novavax, very specifically. It was not for Covishield, okay? Uh, number one. Number two, there is a lot of nebulousness in that official statement the White House put out. Because we don't know what the mode of supply is. We don't know if this is actual shortage and things like that that are being topped up. Because there is no shortage of PPEs in this country. There is no shortage of masks in this country. There is no shortage of N95 masks in this country. What are they sending those things to us for? Right. Second, notice the one word that was missing throughout everybody's tweet yesterday when America finally woke up. What was that one word? Go ahead. Say it. Modi. They are trying specifically to circumvent the government in this. And what they're doing is there's been a whole slew of articles that has come up talking about uh, subnational diplomacy, how America should start dealing with states instead of the central government. It's all, you know, the chronology is too convenient to be coincidence. <laughs> So understand, what was happening was a soft regime change. Now, they've just changed the particular path. They are not going to induce a shortage. They're going to keep it nebulous. We don't know how the supplies are going to be done, so they may still not be done. And it's going to remain nebulous because their agenda is served, the more Indians die. And you can keep cursing Americans who voted Democrat, NRIs who voted Democrat for that. And uh, the next question is about some of your own statements. WTV wants to know, Abhijit, you say Biden and US policymakers are compromised by China. And you also say you don't believe in conspiracy theories about China infiltrating and affecting US policies. Are you not contradicting yourself? Not at all. I don't and believe in conspiracy theories. But boss, Hunter Biden is compromised, you can just tell. Where is the conspiracy theory about it? Have you not seen the videos of him? Look, the, it's taken, do you remember that Wiener fellow? It took a lot less for his entire political career to be destroyed. Yes. All he did was send his dick pics to uh, a women while in a marriage and he was destroyed. By the way, he's this married boy, to Huma. Uh, one second. Uh, he, is, he was married to Huma Abedin, who was supposed to be the uh, chief of staff of Hillary Clinton. Please continue. Right. And now you have this fellow who is in all kinds of positions, BDSM, you know, bondage, domination and sadomasochistic positions with multiple prostitutes, who's clearly got a serious, serious, serious drug uh, problem to the extent that it has caused serious bodily damage to him, who has very, very clear Chinese contacts. Which, and it turns out that all the information that was leaked about him before the elections was actually accurate, even though nobody wanted to uh, 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 cover it. Where is the contradiction here? I think you're, you're confusing individual compromise with a conspiracy theory. Do you understand the difference between the two? I don't think you do. 
Okay, Abhijit, next question is from Chaitanya. What are the defense reforms specifically you would like other than rationalizing of our military equipment? Um, reduction in the command chain. There are too many layers of command. Uh, insisting that 45% of, say, the syllabus should be based on joint operations uh, where, you know, right now we don't have military exercises. We have choreographed ballets where everything is decided beforehand. Okay. Uh, that has to change. The system of promotions has to change. Uh, you need a blind promotion system based on merit, not an opaque promotion system based on God knows what. Uh, it's it's going to take time because look, the the changes that need to be made will have will take about 15, 20 years. And it's not remember, you can't deal with army pro, uh, army reforms as if it's a island. It's linked to society, right? Any institution is as corrupt, as efficient, as uh, inefficient as the rest of society is. So it's it's kind of a very, very complex question that you've asked me because a lot of the reforms will be linked to how how much spending power we have, how much human capital we have. And that's kind of, it's a war if then kind of question you know in programming you've got this line if this then this kind of thing it's it, it's one of those things so it's a whole set of permutations and combinations there are no blanket suggestions the next question is from divyanshu srivastava i think you've answered most of it but i'll read it out anyway because you can add to what you already answered up is much more affected than delhi but our cm is saying there is no shortage of beds in up in Kanpur, one oxygen cylinder is costing one lakh. Our state governments have sadly failed in setting up oxygen plants. Um, what is your read on what's happening in UP? Compound incompetence, criminal incompetence. Because remember, to get your people admitted, you now need a letter from the CMO. So in the midst of doing everything, you also have to run around the CMO, God knows, bribe who, who all and what not to get a letter just to get your relatives admitted into hospital. Right. What is happening in UP is a next level of criminal incompetence. And there's nothing we can do about it. Hmm. Anosh Amaria wants to vote for somebody else the next time round. Anosh Amaria wants to know, what does it take to become a global manufacturing hub like China? Do you see any country taking over China in manufacturing and when? No, I don't see. China will be the last industrial power of our time. Uh, after this, the future is additive manufacturing. So, <coughs> and even there, China can only postpone it by entering high value manufacturing. They're trying very hard. They're not succeeding. They're trying. They're definitely trying. Uh, they will not succeed. Ultimately, additive manufacturing will catch up, which is why you will see China sink in a lot of money and effort into sinking additive manufacturers and additive manufacturing. All right. Uh, and they have enough reserves to do it. So, for example, tomorrow, if a company comes with additive manufactured toothbrushes, they'll just start giving out toothbrushes for free. And there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, I mean, you could invoke anti-dumping, but then they'll claim it's the additive manufacturing that's the uh, dumped product in that sense. So, you know, th there's lots of rules and things that you can manipulate here. China will postpone it significantly. India will not be able to postpone it. So, no, there isn't going to be another industrial power. India has completely missed the bandwagon on this. So, in fact, the next 50 years are going to be a lot worse than the last 50 years. Thank you for that. And the next question is from Shalab Pradhan, and it is to me. Now that we have enterprise cloud offering from PRC as well, like Alibaba Cloud, how long we come up with our own? 
uh, as far as India is concerned, there are many startups in Andhra Pradesh which have their own cloud offering. Today, if I want to, I could host PGurus from there. The only thing is I need to be able to host Pan World. We have what 30% of our customers outside of India. So I have to take that Pan World situation, which is why I'm hosting where I'm hosting. But I'm always looking out for somebody who can do it in India. Who knows? It might happen very soon. Thanks for asking me the question when our expert is sitting here and uh, looking at his uh, phone. Hey, uh, Abhijit, next question. Sriram R. Is Abhijit planning to write books on topics he generally comments on like foreign policy, defense policy, improving the capacity of the Indian state? Have you discovered the author in you? I've written three separate, uh, not books, but chapters in books. One's on Afghanistan, one is on, well, two are on defense reforms, technically. Uh, plus there's a fourth one in the works on the Indian right. But outside of that, uh, no, I don't, because it's just one of those things where I'm more in information collection mode and constantly moving on to learning new things rather than sitting and writing about it. See, writing in journal essays is very important for your tenure of professorship or uh, promotion in a think tank and things like that. But there are multiple avenues to that promotion, right? So for me, it's all about learning and disseminating and training rather than writing. And it's just like a personal choice. My mode of writing is uh, newspapers and uh, uh, me, uh, online publications. Uh, Abhijit, have you been um, tweeting a book? The main reason, the main reason I don't write a book is that when I, I, I read so much and I keep absorbing. Well, I think I absorb. Most people think I'm dumb as hell, but I absorb so much information that. I'm never, so I've got an idea today. By the time I start writing about it, especially a book, I mean, forget a book. We're even talking about like a 6,000 word journal essay. <laughs> I've researched so much that within a week, the entire premise has moved on to something else. And then when I research that again, it's like I can't pin it down, which is why, you know, I write these 800 word <clears throat> newspaper or uh, 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 web portal articles because I write it, put it out there, and then I move on to the next idea. I don't keep harping on it. I don't even read what I've written because in about six months, if I come back to it, I'll be like, shit, that was so unnuanced. I discovered this, 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 this. It's a, for me, it's a constant process of exploration. And see, a book is sort of an ossified thought pattern that requires almost a year to write. And I don't, I can't put my learning pattern on hold for the vanity of having a book. Does that make sense? To me, it does. In fact, I'll tell you one of the reasons. Abhijit, um, in the 1980s, my professors used to tell me that knowledge doubles itself every 10 years. That means whatever we have learned up until now, in the next 10 years, we'll be learning the same amount. Okay. Now, this doubling amount in years has come down to the extent that now it is doubling itself every 18 months. So, so what is, it's, it's a moving target all the time. So we have to be flexible. We have to write what it is for that day. And yeah, tomorrow we are obsolete. That Just take it as it is and then try and uh, uh, you know adapt yourself. So what will happen is you'll have people now, the most sought after talent in my opinion is people who have capacity to do multiple in-depth technologies all at once like be a physicist, an engineer, and a doctor, all three, one. Physicist means the, the theoretical physics, a, engineer, and a doctor. I've met a few people, they're just brilliant, brilliant. And, and, and this is just my personal experience. So th th there are people like that. So this is the way to go. Now, 
Sandeep Rao wants to know your opinion on China offering to help India in pandemic control effort. Are they being sincere or only trying to sell? Sorry, repeat question. What? Ch China has offered to help India in vaccines. Are they being sincere or are they just trying to sell? Even if they're being sincere, boss, never take a Chinese vaccine. <laughs> okay, they, they, they tested that, you know, the uh, effectiveness of the uh, Brazilian study on Chinese vaccines was what, 56%. Right. It has the lowest efficacy in the market. Uh, you know, it, it's just easier. Uh, you have... You, you might as well not take a vaccine than take the Chinese vaccine. Right? It's it just a 56% efficiency rate is almost a placebo, according to me. By the way, a placebo is a pill that does nothing, those of you who don't know this. And these are routinely done when they are trying to do test marketing of a particular product. And, and, and they'll give one section of the audience placebos, the other section of the audience will get the particular pill and then they compare results and so on and so forth. Interesting thing. Hey, uh, Abhijit, have you been tweeting about Franklin Templeton? No. Okay. Uh, Prakash Srivastava, you may want to refine your question because I'm not going to ask Abhijit. He says he's not dealing with uh, Franklin. Please resend your question. Somnath wants to know, I am not aware of source authenticity, but why are we buying oxygen from UAE and other European countries if we have enough oxygen in India? I don't know. That's the point. I don't know. Why are they trying? We need the bloody containers. We don't actually need the bloody oxygen. But I guess what they're doing is, ki bhai, if we're bringing the containers, we might as well bring the oxygen in as well. Because when land hoga, tab immediately le jayenge, as opposed to say, right. yeah, as opposed to container aayega, fir we take it all the way to Jamshedpur or we take it all the way to Bellari, fill it up and bring it up. So that's okay. I mean, it adds to the weight that you're carrying because, you know, the densest way in which you can take oxygen is liquid oxygen. That's the most efficient. So, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't know how many fit into a C-17 or what the weight of an oxygen thing is. But if they have determined that it is, then that, that's the only logical explanation for it. And Shreyansh Patel wants to know, do you think this second way will be fatal to BJP's electoral prospects and has the fall of BJP started with this mistake of mismanaging the pandemic? I'm not sure it is a mistake. My thoughts, your, go ahead. No, I'm not seeing that happen actually. I'm not. I'm genuinely not. I know the um, uh, TV channels and international press are working overtime to do it. But look, a lot of the anger in Maharashtra is directed at their government. A lot of the anger in Delhi is directed at the Delhi government, etc., etc., etc. A lot of the anger in UP is directed at the UP government. And look, there's enough blame to go around all over. So it doesn't, uh, I'm not seeing it exactly refract back onto uh, uh, Modi. I just am not. Um, the next we'll question. see. We'll see on May the second. We'll see on May the second because all the subsequent poll phases should tell you. I think we should know which constituencies voted uh, post this crisis hitting and what electoral impact it had. Thank you. And uh, the next question is from Kunal Joshi. He is working on a non-profit YouTube channel about historical battles in India that are not taught in history books. Want to help Indic narrative? Would you, would like some guidance uh, once the video or videos are ready? Where to contact you, Abhijit? I will give my email address. Uh, Kunal, you can send it to si my initials at pgurus.com, and I'll Gee, help you. You're echoing a lot. You're you're echoing a lot. I huh. I'm finding it very difficult to hear you. I'm so sorry. Hold on a second. Let me check here. Uh, Is it better now? Somewhat. Is it better now? Okay. Let me let me lower it. Yeah, yeah. Better now. Okay. Is it better yeah. now? I've lowered myself. Much I'm so sorry about much that. Better. Okay. 
All right. So the question is, I'm just, I, um, I'm, I'm jo Kunal Joshi. I'm just giving you my email address, si, my initials at pgurus.com. And if there's a need to rope in Abhijit, I will certainly reach out to him. Also, you may have to, you may want to look at pgurus channel uh, website. We have something called the Real History of India, where we start from around 650 AD when Raja Dahir was defeated. Up from that point forward, as to how many Hindu kings were fighting these oppression, these invasions from abroad, and then you know Lalita Ditya and uh, Bhoj and Raval Bappa Raval, who, after whom the the city Raval Pindi is named. Of course, if we keep saying this. Islamabad will think that, oh, we need to rename this city also, and they might as well do it. Uh, <laughs> they have nothing better to do. <laughs> but anyway, so let's go on to the next question, Abhijit. Watch, um, this is from again Kunal Joshi. Watch your videos on LCA, your views on how good or bad is our carbon fiber quality compared to other countries should we continue with it in amca i don't know what amca is carbon fiber quality advanced medium combat aircraft um apparently they improved the quality before it wasn't very good but apparently thanks to the uh, alh uh they improved the quality so um yeah apparently it's manufactured industrially now and it's decent quality and yet yeah, look carbon fiber is good if you have managed to get uh, industrial quality manufacturing that's good my issue has always been with quality control because uh, quality control is a function of labor unless you can discipline labor you can't have quality control uh, including in carbon fiber manufacturing in fact more so the higher the tech the more discipline you need so let's see. It's not just the manufacturing process has been sorted out. I don't know about the labor. Uh, the next question is from Aryendra Singh. I have noticed that when people hate Modi, then without any reason, they have to hate RSS, pro-nationalist, right-wing, etc. Why is there such a patterned hate? I don't know. I honestly don't know. It's I, the fact that India keeps voting for Modi and the RSS is the main support base. Therefore, they don't know what to hit. The more they fail electorally, they feel they've got to attack anyone and everyone voting for or supporting Modi in order to take Modi down. That's the only thing I can think of. Hmm. Um, is the sound OK now? Yeah, much better. Okay, thank you. Ashit Chandok wants to know, uh, Abhijit, do you consider yourself Occidentalist? Yes, very much so. And why? Very much so. There's, there's a whole load of Oriental mumbo-jumbo that I'm just not willing to accept. Okay, uh, because a lot of this Oriental mumbo jumbo is the same uh, Boko Haram shit like lived experience. Okay, I don't accept lived experience. I ex I accept facts. I accept methodology, and uh, in that I'm very very occidental in my training. Yes. Um, the next question is um, about your culinary taste. Plexus Gamer wants to know: Have you had beetroot sambar? Mm, I've made beetroot sambar. It's delicious, but I prefer beetroot curry, you know. Beetroot, uh, the main thing about, uh, and that's my favorite kind of curry, because what you do is you just put it in a microwave and put sambar podi, uh, urad dal, as in you heat up some oil and crackle urad dal and mustard in it and a bit of curry leaf. Half it. So first you steam it in the microwave with a, 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 a cling film for about 10-15 uh, minutes, then open then add a uh, 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 hot oil with mustard, uh, seed, uh, urad dal, and curry leaf. And I always mix in a bit of sambar powder after I've added the hot oil into the beetroot and then cook it without the cling wrap for about 10 minutes. It's delicious. I think I prefer that to beetroot sambar because I don't think beetroot adds anything to a sambar. 
Rene Joseph wants to know why is AIM that is you so negative on India's growth? Because I'm a realist, Baba. I've seen. Uh, uh, tell me, why are you so positive? Because, you know, I've seen four waves of technology transfer just with regards to fighter aircraft. I've seen the NAT, which became the Marut ultimately. I've seen uh, the MiG-21, the MiG-27, the Jaguar, the Sukhoi, none of which has helped you indigenize. And I'm negative because I study a lot of anthropology. I used to be very positive as long as I was siloed into just military. And then my last boss at ORF Samaran used to force me to, he said, you will not understand uh, 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 this, uh, this subject till you understand how intersectional defense is. And I used to hate it. I used to keep cursing him, give him Maa Baap Ki Galis straight to his face. Because he said for the first year, he's not letting me work on defense. I should only work on education, nutrition, and, uh, uh, you know, things like that. And I was like, what the hell, what am I doing here? And then I realized he was absolutely right. And when you start aggregating all the points, there is no room for optimism because there is no ways and means. You know, you can't survive just on hope and optimism. Hope and optimism is not a substitute for policy. Hope and optimism is not a substitute for ways and means. Hope and optimism is not a substitute for money. If you think it is, I suggest you start thinking you'll be Bill Gates or Steve Jobs. Uh, uh, don't spend any money on your education. Don't take any risk or anything and see if you end up being Steve Jobs. If you think that's what makes a Steve Jobs, congratulations to you. It doesn't. I'm very much about accounting. And this is where I guess my useless BCom degree comes into the thing. That if the accounts don't match up, you can't get to the end. It's that simple. Um, Shailesh Latkar wants to know, based on the German Chancellor's comments, do you see, do we see a shift in the way that Germans view India? Is this something that is permanent or temporary? No, it's not a major shift. Uh, her comments are, let's be clear, they're reality. Okay, India likes to talk itself up as a great uh, whatever, whatever. And that, you know, greatness is based on the fact that we copulate and reproduce like rabbits. Uh, if reproduction was the only criteria for, uh, 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 you know, uh, greatness, then mosquitoes should be the most dominant species on Earth. Uh, they're not. So, uh, you know, a reproduction based definition of greatness, as all Indians subscribe to, is not my definition of greatness. And yes, we are beggars. We depend for a lot on the West, uh, on Germany, on the EU, on America, uh, even on China for a lot of things. So uh, she wasn't exactly inaccurate in what she said, you know. Uh, is that a shift in attitude? No, it was just a statement of fact that India doesn't have leverage. If India threatens, it may take a year, it may take two years, but they will ensure that uh, they find an alternate producer, an alternate pharma uh, competitor. Uh, and, uh, you know, China that way has far greater leverage because Chinese the Chinese price point is very hard to beat. For whatever reason, market manipulation, corruption, purchase of uh, 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 CDU members or senators or Democrats or whatever, uh, all of that's fine. But... China can do, has leverage, India does not. Omkar Kulkarni wants to know, who are calling the COVID-related decisions? Is it the PMO, a task force, CMOs, who are they? We don't know. That's the whole point, we don't know. And the next question is from Sridham. Um, is Abhijit interested in taking up a post and working for the Indian government like how Amish Tripathi now works as the director of the Nehru Centre in London? Hmm, no. Why not? Because invariably what it will be like those uh, lateral intakes. Uh, you are completely constrained. You can't do what you want to do. Uh, 
y- you're not given this isn't like bringing in empowered people from all i've seen with these lateral entries in fact they get subordinated to the bureaucracy so if it's getting subordinated to the bureaucracy i might as well not do that next question i think if this has something, if it's something that gives me the freedom to do what i want like just carte blanche fix defense production in this country you have freedom to do what you want i will give you basically like you know uh, say the manmohan uh, pv narsimha rao agreement i will pick up the political costs but these are the political r- red lines you can't sack all these workers or at least find some way of giving them a golden handshake or something like that yeah but just these bureaucratic jobs no i've seen um, bureaucratic jobs they are the most pointless no i'm the son of two bureaucrats na no? i've seen i used to see all my mum's files even though i didn't understand them because i was a v- very young kid my dad could show me the files because they were all top secret even if i was a very young kid uh, <coughs> <laughs> they are all routine micro detail work and you keep getting bogged down in micro detail because and in fact the lateral entries have it far far tougher because they don't understand these bureaucratic tricks and games that is why let me give a nuanced answer now uh depends on what the job is and what the powers of that job are if it's just tamasha ka that you know i can put it on my cv saying i was joint secretary to government or joint secretary equivalent to government or something like that no because it will actually you know, bring down my income quite significantly <laughs> you know your tweet about the united states policy versus vis-a-vis india you said something to the effect that business to government is okay business to business is okay government to business is okay government to government is not okay the next caller wants you to expand a little bit more about this His name is krishna bhargav very simple they don't want the government to get any credit for this okay so businesses shouldn't be dealing with government government shouldn't be dealing with government but if business houses want to take credit for doing certain things or bringing in certain actions that's fine it's that simple it's like i said it's soft regime change they don't want to let modi off the hook they want modi to stew which is why they've done this deliberately they've ta- they could have taken this action almost a week week and a half back don't tell me jen saki and that other idiot who, uh, the white house uh, press council didn't know what they were saying when they went out and said it or maybe jen saki didn't understand what she was saying when she said it but the second time when the question came up you know jen saki's famous i'll circle back to you so either the argument is that the Biden White House is even more driven by incompetence than the Trump White House or if it isn't which is what everybody is claiming it isn't that it was deliberate Abhijit have you noticed that there is hardly any activity or mention of the chief of staff in this administration Yeah Who is the chief of staff by the way? <laughs> I've lost his name man. I'm I don't know. Yeah, exactly. I've lost the name too. <laughs> yeah, you know, I see when Obama settled in that India policy is being run by this lady called uh, Sumana Guha. Uh she's hmm. an Afghan specialist. She's not an India specialist. She's an Afghan specialist in uh, uh the National Security Council and uh the thing is she uh uh she wiped her entire twitter account clean so we have nothing to go by however i did find that one particularly trenchant anti india fellow used to keep tagging her in his tweets saying see this see that now you can't draw a conclusion of where she uh, falls but because she's a political democrat i think we all know where she falls in this oh by the way you have a huge fan following in washington dc abhijit I've been tracking some analytics. Lots of people watch what you have to say about, well, the world in general. Uh, in in the Beltway, the Beltway experts are really hanging on your words. So if you want to say a message, I'm sure it will reach her ears 
uh, through this channel. Um, Praise I, be. May, may, may the love of Jesus, our Lord and Christ, and our only true Savior be on her. <laughs> Omkar Kulkarni wants to know, between the think tanks ORF and Vivekananda Foundation, who is doing better research and where should they focus next? India mein research nahi hota hai, India mein commentary hota hai. Okay, uh, there is no money earmarked for proper in-depth research. What passes off as research is conference papers. Uh, unlike, say, an American think tank that will actually earmark for you to go talk to people, because remember, research is expensive. You have to go to a country. You have to have access in that country. You have to talk to people. It takes time to create that picture. The kind of research I've seen being done by American think tanks like, say, Carnegie or Stimson, where they invest over multi-year programs, go there, invest in their people, in their junior staff, in their middle staff, in their senior staff, it just does not happen in India, boss. It's all... I went to a conference, I was in a five-star hotel, I was business class travel, I uh, I uh, met these 10 people, I spoke to them, and that is my research. Exchange business cards. Yeah. And uh, Santosh Bihar wants why, to... Which is why I travel so much on my own dime. Which is why I keep trying to go to Iran and Central Asia and things like that to see things on the ground. Because see, when I go to Iran on an official... Uh, delegation like a track two or whatever, I'm only getting what the government wants me to get. Their government wants me to get. I'm not getting the ground situation. I'm not talking to people and things like that. And because there's a language barrier, you en you'll end up not talking to people. Whereas when you walk around and talk to people or when you go off, take a car and a driver and go off on your own to check out things, it's a completely different picture. And, you know, this is where that ORF training of looking not just at, you know, when we go for an oil summit or something like that, it's not just oil that you're looking at. You're looking at the anthropology of the place. What is the political feel of the place? What is the uh, anger against the government or the king or uh, the president or whatever it is out there? There are so many things that go into it. So, see, there's a there's an undefinable qualitative aspect to doing research. But in India, there is neither the qualitative nor realistically the quantitative. Uh, next question. Santosh Bihar wants to know, will a military administered government work for India? And he wants both our views. I'll let you go first. Like I've said before on this program, the military isn't some, uh, it isn't a pankaja. You know what the word pankaja comes from, na? Panka. You're a punk, man. You know, dirt, scum. Panka Aja, that which grows out of the dirt. So, you know, this pure, pristine lotus that comes out of the muck. There's a reason it is a religious symbol. Why? Because it is the exception to the rule. It is the exception that proves the rule. Okay. Nowhere is your military, your Supreme Court, whatever, going to be different from society. They are a reflection of your society. So the same incompetence that plagues your uh, political establishment, your judicial establishment, your police establishment, your bureaucratic establishment, the same thing plagues the military. Okay? So they are... The, 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 and what is actually going to get worse is you're going to have a bunch of incompetent buffoons that you can't even crib about. Here at least you can crib and kind of hold up a mirror to them. In this case, you know, I, I know a lot of people have shown a lot of hate towards the foreign press over showing Shamshan Ghats. Notice in my TL, I haven't ever criticized them for showing uh, 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 Shamshan Ghats. Why? Because it's an essential mirror to hold up to the government. So in a military dictatorship, you have a double negative. One is you're saddled with the ongoing incompetence. But second, you have no redressal process. And, and also, viewers, although as we are very critical of our politicians, it's not easy being a politician in India. They, their eyes open in the morning, there'll be like 100 people wanting to give them petitions, follow-up, questions. I need this, I need this. 
and and till their eyes you know till they close their eyes in the evening this thing continues so to be able to put up with all that with a smile it's not easy so uh, i'm not so sure military would be up for that kind of stuff so that that's where we stand now the next question is shailesh latkar will bringing up sputnik vaccine help or do we need to throw more resources at covid shield given the manufacturing scalability sputnik look it doesn't matter which one you use i would say it's best to have a mix of as many vaccines as possible right now focus on sputnik covid shield and covaxin uh, they're all very good they all have extremely high efficacy rates just scale up the production and get the bloody vaccination done that's it right now you do not have the luxury of saying should we do this should we do that you know the old saying what one a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush you've got three in hand that's better than six in the bush and viewers we are uh, in our second hour now we need to wrap this thing up fast so i don't want to take any more questions i have a few questions left to ask of abhijit so please stop sending our you sending in your questions you can send them next week we'll be happy to honor your questions next week and do subscribe to our channel today they have a lot of people perhaps you are staying home perhaps uh, abhijit has uh, really uh, irked someone's uh, sensibilities with his uh, sharp tweets uh, in the last few days i don't know what i'm very happy for that that so many of you have tuned in today and are listening to this program here are the last three questions um Suresh Valayapathur wants to know with Saudi in our corner now would you say it's a foreign policy victory if yes what's worked in Saudi and UAE etc is still not working with the western world and that should tell you a lot who was the only variable in this and why is that not changing so clearly it's nothing india has done on the other hand saudi arabia is the one that has reset its relations with everybody saudi arabia has reset its relations with israel they reset their um, uh, relations with trump after all the bad blood between obama and the saudis uh, they reset their relations with india as a consequence of it indian diplomacy had nothing to do with it okay this is one of those things where we love to take credit for things that we haven't done right classic hot air balloon this is what i keep saying you know in india the amount of hot air we produce it's enough to solve our energy problems we don't need nuclear energy we don't need solar energy you know every indian is a walking talking biogas plant <laughs> just fit one tube to your mouth one to your ass you'll solve you'll be completely energy independent <laughs> you're making me visualize this <laughs> kunal joshi wants to know could you suggest top 3 books for each in defense india hinduism world war 2 no i can't and i'll tell you why you know the problem is everybody wants the entire thing condensed to them in one okay as i've learned like i told you uh, with that what samir saran made me do at orf you can't get the answer in one boss when i read a book that's great in one week i've decided uh, for for two weeks it was great after two weeks i've decided oh isme ye fault tha usme wo fault tha this that completely new hypothesis based on it so you know but but generally if you want one book one or two three books that have stood the test of time uh, i'd say just read everything by ian morris okay why the west rules for now why social development matters they're kind of gold standard they're much better than yuval harari though yuval harari has celebrity i think ian morris has a lot more substance just go by those books i think it'll bring a lot not all but it'll bring a lot together for you but that's about it on hinduism i don't uh, read a book because Hinduism isn't a book based thing it's about your personal relationship and everybody's personal relationship with their god or their lack of god is different and what was the third subject he wanted uh world war 2 world war 2 okay uh there's 
look, it's the issue there again is, you know, uh, there's no book. It's it's so many things you have to, because nobody gets everything 100% right or 100% perspicacious because any book that you get, 80% of it will be banal, 20% of it will be genius, right? So it, it, you have to keep reading lots and lots and lots of books. Like if you want to learn about World War, you'll have to read at least 100 books to get a 20% remotely 20% accurate image of what happened. But I think one of the best, the most memorable works that I read was Bloodlands. Uh, it's about what happened in Poland and the Ukraine in the uh, interwar years between the First and the Second World War. And I thought that was a very, very important book to read. Yeah. And uh, my two cents to what Abhijit just said, there are lots of shows in Amazon and Netflix on Churchill and World War II. These are, these are well done because they are documented and they are fairly accurate. And, you know, within four, six hours of time, you can actually get a feel for what, how things were, how things changed. And there's one book uh, I... Can I just... Sorry, I'm going to contradict you there completely, Shri. Please do not watch these Netflix programs. They're highly, uh, 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 you know, uh, unrealistic. You know, they sacrifice a lot for dramatization and things like that. There are a few uh, 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 um, uh, YouTube channels, on the other hand, which don't dramatize, which are extremely well-researched. One is Kings and Generals channel. One is uh, Ep Epithemius channel and one is History Matters channel. Uh, go check them out because they're very short clips and they're meant for you to learn. They're not meant for, you know, dramatic effect or production values and things like that. I will get some more YouTube channels. I actually find and, you know, I realized this after cooking. All these celebrity chefs would give you the recipe for, say, butter chicken or Jardalu Sali Boti or whatever, and it would all be crap. To use a Tamil f phrase, while a vekka saikad. Right? Uh, 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 they were rubbish. And these YouTube chefs actually did a much better job. And I'm invariably finding that these YouTube uh, niche channels, they actually do a much better better, better work of these things. And they give you new points of reference. So if you don't trust them or whatever, because they always cite sources and things, you can always go back to source and check. And I found lots of gems of writing based on sources uh, cited by them. And they're much, much more accurate because they're not trying to, you know, um, talk up certain things. But what I'll do is, uh, Shri, by the next week, I'll give you a list. Sure. Uh, you can we'll put that up on the yeah. website or something like that. That would Absolutely. be really good. Absolutely. We will do that. We will do that. And this is the last question. Uttara Shah wants to know, has Modi done the right thing by not, at least yet, responding to Biden's statement about sending help to India? Absolutely. He shouldn't acknowledge it at all. So with that, we bring our program of today to a close. Um, thank you very much, Abhijit. And as always, viewers, thanks for your participation, your questions. I know we left out a few, but uh, it's getting really late now for Abhijit. And uh, I felt that this was a good point to put a stop. Please don't forget to subscribe to our channel if you already have not. And also join our membership. And Abhijit will continue to regale us with his experiences and stories and his cooking episodes over you know, basically going to distribute his gyan. And, and, and when somebody reads as much as he does, you will get a lot of insights that perhaps will take you much more time to gather that. Thank you once again, Abhijit, and Namaskar. Vail, vail, vetri vail. Thank you. Vetri vail, vira vail. <laughs>